talk tonight about the climate migration industrial complex. Like 
oh my god, there are migrants dying in the Mediterranean constantly. Yeah, I know. Like I've been keeping track of this stuff for years now. Um, so I mean, it was so there was a lot of attention to the book, which is good, but also weird. Um, it's a weird feeling, um, and also sort of dark. And speaking of darkness, uh, so the, the, this is the paper uh, I bring you to now. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna give a brief introduction. Um, I'm gonna read a little bit from the paper, and just so that I get some of my facts straight, and then uh, maybe add add some things as needed. Um, a brief introduction about sort of what Roland was saying. Um, he sort of stole some of my introduction, which was just generally to say that like we're living in a really dramatic time of mobility. I mean, it, with respect to human history. It's not, it's, I mean, yes, humans on the move in record numbers, um, but also everything else on the move in record numbers. Um, I was just reading that um, over half of the species of plants and animals on the earth are migrating as well, a largely north because of climate change. So it's not, it's not just humans. Um, there's also enormous amounts of migration of, of, of animals and insects and viruses now, which is the second part of the talk. COVID's not mentioned in here, but it's, it's gonna be part of the paper. Uh, because it's it's on all our minds right now, um, and it's really yeah interrelated to, to the argument I want to make. Um, yes, so climate change. Um, this is this is this is one main mover. Um, yeah, by 2050, demographers expect two billion more people to be migrate to urban centers worldwide. I mean, that's that's not that far away, but we're talking about enormous amounts of. I mean, and it's really like euphemistic to say like, oh, migration to urban centers. Like, it makes it sound like people just want to go to the cities. No, they don't. Like, they want they oh, they are forced to go to cities in part because their lands are being stolen from them, or they're being destroyed through ecological, direct ecological destruction or climate change. So part of this like urbanization, I don't know if you've heard that I mean like global urbanization was a while ago. People were like, oh, more than half of the people on the planet now live in cities. And it's like, is that is that a good thing? Like, I I, I mean, what what are you where are you coming from with this? As if it was this fact of like, oh, we're all moving to cities. Like, well, no, people are being forced to move into cities. Uh, obviously, there are people that reside in cities and continue to. But the fact that those numbers are growing shouldn't be something that we should be especially excited about because it means mass migration. That means largely displacement. So um, these are some of the things that are going on, uh, going on right now. Humans, plants, animals. I mean, if you even want to think about it at the level of like inanimate objects. I mean, just think about it at a level, I mean, even though it's mind-boggling to think about it. Physically speaking, like if you just looked at material on the surface of the earth, like per square meter or something like that, how much of that is now moving around? Like we're talking about, you know, commercial goods, we're talking about boats, planes, all the junk, spaceships, things that we've like now thrown into the outer atmosphere and, you know, orbiting around the planet at, you know, hundreds of thousands of miles per hour, making it extremely dangerous to send anything into space, um, including Elon Musk's satellites, you know, <laughs> just like, when that happened, like, first of all, it scared the hell out of me, because I didn't know about it, and I was walking at night, and I saw, I'm like, what is going on with those dots, you know what I'm talking about, you see the dots moving across the sky, it's really, it was shocking, and then, I don't, I was like, this, this is not aliens, it's not birds, it's can't be planes. I was like, it took, like, my friends and I were like, I don't even know what we're seeing right now. And then looked it up, and I was like, just absolutely depressed, I think, for a week. And I don't think anybody was quite as angry about it as me, so I, like, just kind of toned it down a bit. But it was very upsetting, this was happening. But then recently in the news, did you read that, like, the satellites, like, even though, you know, NASA and the scientists were like, don't do it, it's not the time, we're about to have solar flare, like, they just did it anyway, it launched the satellites, and then they all just, like, fell out of orbit, like, burned up. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> My point is that, at like, I mean, if you look at like the scope of the material, just from like a geological perspective, all of these geological layers, it's just like we've like cranked up the temperature. Like the Earth is this boiling pot of water that now everything's just like flying in the air, moving all over the place. Um, I mean, the idea behind it is roughly that we think we can control, control planetary movement. Movement of human beings, movements of plants and animals, movements of geological strata, chicken bones, styrofoam, nuclear waste. Like, we think we can just move all this stuff around. They're like, oh, well, it's just a forest. Like, do, you know, you log it and then sell the wood. And it's like, no, you destroyed everything. You can't just, like, replant an old growth forest. It doesn't work like that. So, like, this assumption that everything can be cut up into pieces and then moved around. Uh, I mean, capitalism and commodities are, you know, one of the most dramatic examples of treating the world like that. Um, and lots of terrible consequences follow. Now, this brings us to the second part, which is one of the attempts to deal with all of this movement, um, to master this movement, are borders. So about 30 years ago, around the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall, there were 15 walls, major walls around the world. And there's Ronald Reagan at the fall of the Berlin Wall saying, 
this is it. This is like the beginning of the end of borders, like capitalism, free trade, like it's going to, the world is going to open up and the borders are going to disappear and it's going to be a one world community. You're like, okay, now, today, 30 years later, we have 77 major walls. I mean, absolutely enormous numbers of refugees, just world historical numbers of refugees um, and undocumented migrants. Now, one way to look at that is to say, ah, oh, well, this is like the failure of a kind of, you know, liberal capitalist democratic project. They thought they were going to, you know, remove all the borders and they thought it was going to be free and so they failed and that project is over. But unfortunately, that's not, that's not exactly what's happened. Uh, what's happened is the increasing number of borders has produced an incredibly large industry, an entire industry that is worth, now this is the point I need to look at my lecture here, $742 billion by 2023, which I think I like knew that several years ago. Now that number gets closer and closer and closer, and that industry gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And what are we talking about? So this is a really, this is, this is an enormous global industry composed of uh, a lot of private corporations. Many of them are, you know, these are like G4, Wack and HUD. These are like, you know, military weapons organizations. These are uh, emerging, you know, uh, amalgams of previous ones. Um, I'm going to give a list here. This includes, so this, what they are, what they are monetizing is security. Um, an enormous security apparatus to secure against a number of interrelated things. And this, I mean, it's dark, but you know, when you think about what the future is holding, there's already like, you know, there are people behind doors and capitalists who are like, oh yeah, we've been thinking about what's going on in the future for a long time because we're interested in capitalizing on that. And we plan for the following things. An increasing number of borders, rising tides around the planet, enormous numbers of migrants and so-called vote people, right? And all this xenophobic responses to migrants. So they've thought about this. And the result is this industry, which is the building of borders, the building uh, and maintenance of detention centers, um, surveillance technologies, and consultants and developers who will go to countries and say, oh, you have a migration problem. Like, we've got a lot of technologies. We know how to build walls, fences. We know how to do you know, ID software, surveillance cameras. Like, all of these techniques have been in the works for a long time. And now they've been honed into this entire industry that just goes around to countries uh, and sells this complex of things and makes absolutely billions of dollars about it. So uh, uh, from it, uh, deportation, transportation contractors, that's like, these are all the people that um, will take people from detention centers, bring them across the other side of borders or airplanes, trucks, and so on. Uh, I mean, maybe you don't think about it, but that's, I mean, people get paid to do that. So the governments pay uh, private contractors to do all that. So this is, a, this is I mean, a growing army of sort of subcontractors profiting from insecurity. Um, this is also ecological insecurity. So climate change uh, and climate change related migration, these are sort of two sides of the same, the same industry that's making a lot of money off of this. Um, okay. Let's talk about first, so there's like kind of several parts. I know it's like really unwieldy kind of topic or title for this paper, which was the, you know, the, the migration climate industrial complex. I'm like, oh, that sounds terrible. I mean, it's, I, I can't think of a better way to say that. That's not like many, many words longer. Um, it's awkward to say, I'm sorry, but let's start with the migration industrial complex, and then we'll talk about the climate migration industrial complex, and then the COVID. See that the COVID <laughs> part would make this like ridiculous title. The COVID climate migration industrial complex. Okay, so I'm not going to say that whole thing again. Um, but those are the pieces, okay? On migration. So the first one is the migration industrial complex. Um, one way to think about that is there is money to be made for migration. One way that some scholars think about migration is like, well, it's it's you know it's it's a byproduct of of global capitalism. It's, it's, an, it's unfortunate, this is just how it is. Migration is, a, is this kind of, you know, this residual product, this epiphenomenon to the primary thing of, of global capitalism and history of colonialism. Okay, but the thing is, it's not, it's not just the product. Um, it's also the thing that actually shapes and reproduces capital as well. It's not just the product, it's a sort of feedback loop. Um, and let me sort of highlight this, 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 this tension for you. So I teach a class on the political philosophy of migration. Um, and in the class, one of the first things we do is go through this nice list that's been uh, put together by scholars of just going through the myths about migration, like immigrants bring crime, 
immigrants bring disease, immigrants don't pay taxes, immigrants hurt the economy, like all of that stuff is false. Like it's just objectively false. And then all the citations and scholarship showing all those things are wrong. But it's a good way to start a conversation of like, okay, what the news is telling you, like as if this was some kind of question, like are they taking taxes? No, this is not a legitimate question. There's empirical evidence showing migrants do pay taxes, okay? Um, and a million other things, and like, where do all their taxes go when they get paid? Oh, they go straight to the government. There's like a huge fund that's just like taxes paid by migrants that can't claim it because they were taxed as undocumented, so they can't pay for them. Okay, so um, one way to think about so the, par the, the this is this is this is the starting paradox is on the one hand you have after students learn all these myths they say well if migrants are so good for the economy which is all of the economic data showing like when people when people migrate this increases the, the gdp of those economies if migrants are so good they don't bring any crime they bring disease they just really make the societies a lot better stronger and make money for the people to, who for whom they go to those countries and the students like well then why why are people saying they don't want immigrants i mean okay one of the obvious ones is just yeah racism like that has to be said like that is an aspect of what is going on here um, but there's something more as well uh, that's related to this, which is um, there's, 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 there's the response on the right wing in the United States, a kind of xenophobic, anti-immigrant uh, uh, sentiment, which is like, we don't want any immigrants, or, you know, if they're being more polite about it or something like, no undocumented immigrants because they're like breaking the law or something like that. So on one side, you have uh, the real information about what immigrants do. On the other side, you have this story that immigrants are bringing crime and so on. There's this right-wing belief in all of these completely false things um, that is that seems very anti-immigrant. And what's that based on? Nothing, it turns out, except probably racism and xenophobia. Um, the other part of this story is that um, there that that economists know very well. Uh, if you ask an economist, they'd be like, "Oh yeah, migrants. We know that they're good for the economy, and this is this is this is what keeps this economy going." And dear right wingers, if you actually removed every undocumented person in this country, like huge economy, parts of the economy would just totally collapse. So like, there's this weird way in which that desire to remove migrants is actually undermined entirely <laughs> the American economy. Um, we're talking about 12 million undocumented people and many, many more that are documented and partially status uh, working in the United States. So like, this sounds on the face of it like this big contradiction. Even though you're going to have, you, they contribute enormously to the economy, there is this very, there's a desire in the United States among a xenophobic population to, to, to not want those people there, to remove them all. So like, how does that, how does that make any sense? Um, how can those people maintain the belief that they want all immigrants instead of knowing that it's going to destroy the economy? Okay, but here's the thing. It, capitalists don't just like to make money. It's not like you just like, we need workers. It's like they prefer partially status, non-status, cheap labor that can be hyper-exploited. It's not like they just want any labor. It's they're very interested in specifically hyper-exploitable labor of any kind. Now, what contributes to hyper-exploitable labor? All kinds of things on uh, axes of, 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 of race and gender and status. Um, but the, the, the migration status is definitely one in this context. Now, this is where, this is where like, I mean, it's not Trump's solution, but I'm going to call it the Trump solution because he made a very big deal out of it most recently. And he honestly, like, he just performed it so perfectly, whereas other people equivocated. Trump always had said this was his strategy, anti-immigrant, pro-economy. Like, no, that's not, I mean, look at the facts, that's not actually possible. Well, here's how it works, it is the, the, the deep racism uh, and absolutely unfounded bigoted myths about migrants actually help dehumanize and devalorize the migrants who arrive such that they become hyper-exploitable by the economy. So these are underpaid, uh, exploited labor. So these things work hand in hand. They're not a contradiction. On the face of it, it looks like there's some kind of ideological contradiction between uh, you know, a, a, a kind of a, a racist idea of removing immigrants entirely and then you know, the demand like, we want you know, a, have a successful economy. Well, look, you know, those don't really work. But the, that, that racism, it doesn't contradict it, or the anti-immigrant sentiment doesn't contradict it. It actually fuels it. It actually makes the economic benefit possible. Does that make sense? Like, that's what initially it seems like, well, how can you have these two tensions, and this is how it's resolved? Um, not resolved, but actually, yeah, I mean, made much worse. Um, so this is to say that racialization, dehumanization, actually contribute to hyper-exploitation. It's one of the reasons migrants are so beneficial to the economy is precisely because they can be paid less. And why can they be paid less? Precisely because they've been dehumanized um, and devalorized.
Um, their labor isn't worth as much. They can be not paid. You know, I can go on and on and on. Okay, that's the first stage. There's, there's, a, there's already there's an industry that makes this possible, um, and I already briefly alluded to it. But here's 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 the rough cycle of how this how this works. The migration complex. Um, so you have you know you have migrants who. Oh, and this is the case just because I know it because I've researched it uh, quite a bit, the U.S.-Mexico border. You have migrants who come across, okay, I'm just going to start there because it's a loop, so we could really start colonialism, neocolonialism, uh, but we're going to start with migrants moving to the United States um, for lots of reasons that, that it would take a long time to explain all the reasons why migrants move. Um, move to the United States um, under conditions, so if this is the wall, um, the wall, I mean, it doesn't actually, I mean, it does a lot of things, but one of the things the wall doesn't really do is stop human movement. Uh, most people, so the success rate is like 90% on the third try of trying to cross the, the, the border wall. Now, lots of people die. Uh, over 5,000 people since 1994 have died trying to cross the wall. So it definitely kills people, and you could say technically that stops them, but it doesn't demotivate people from actually trying. What it does is it pushes them towards what's called the Devil's Highway right in the middle of the desert where, um, so if you fortify the cities, um, El Paso, San Diego, then what you do, and then the, the borders become less and less and less as you reach the desert, then it pushes migrants. It's called, I mean, it's crazy. The US the government has its own reports about all of this. It's not like a mystery, like, oh, there's a thing. No, there's a name, it's called the funnel effect. And like, there's all these government reports about, like, yeah, there's a funnel effect that sh pushes people into the desert where they're more likely to die. Okay, so anyway, the, that's, so death, it causes, people cross over, uh, migrants cross over, they are, um, the wall, one of the functions of the wall is essentially to criminalize uh, migration. So it attaches a criminal stigma. You've broken a law because you've passed this wall, and now on the other side, you are not allowed to work, and you can be uh, deported. But what that does is it produces migrants who are in a precarious uh, position, such that they can be um, paid lower wages, and they um, they can't participate in unions. They are being taxed without having you know any of the benefits of the taxation. So all of this hyper exploitation sometimes is not even paid. Um, and then what happens is eventually, at some point, okay, this is not a universal. This is general tendency about what happens. At some point, they are um, uh, apprehended. Um, at some point, they are they have they are without status uh, and they're apprehended. Or, I mean, sometimes employers just call immigration, um, and then those people uh, they go to a detention center, right? So you have private a, a private detention center complex, who now is like an enormous lobby, and they are lobbying to keep migrants there as long as possible, um, and they have a vested interest, right? I mean, because you've made a private company now responsible for detaining immigrants, now you have them lobbying to keep them there. Like, well, I think we should keep them there as long as possible, like up to a year or more. Yeah, without any criminal charges. Like, well, they've just been apprehended. Well, let's hear their case. And Trump was very much part of making it, like, well, let's prosecute them as criminals. And it's like, if you do that, if you actually prosecute everybody, every single migrant has to go to court and have a lawyer and all this stuff, it backlogs the entire system. Um, and, well, that's really the least of it. But the point is, is that once they have to go through, they go through a legal system, they go through the detention center, um, after the detention center, which is extracting $200 per night, per migrant, uh, they keep them there as long as possible, many up to a year. And then after that, they enter another series of stages, right? Um, you have, you know, what I was just saying, so the, the transportation network, so these are cars, trucks. Um, you also have the surveillance company, so surveillance, is surveil surveillance and security is working in the detention center, it's working in the transport, this is really small, I'm sure you can't read it here, but you see the square, that's it. Transport systems then bring migrants back right across the border to Tijuana, um, in which they will then begin the cycle again. And now there's a vested interest in this industry right here, keeping this going. Like, they don't want the wall to actually stop people. I mean, lucky for them, I suppose, it doesn't actually stop people from moving. But unfortunately, it criminalizes them, making it possible for the whole, uh, this system to work, make its money, deport people, and then repeat. Do you see what I'm saying? So, so this, is, this, is, this is sort of related um, to the philosophy of movement. I think about patterns of movement um, at sort of macroscopic scales here, um, and think about the, the structures of circulation. It's not a contradiction. There's not any contradictions going on here. It is a, a perfectly coherent system meant to extract as much money as possible uh, from migrants. Okay, 
That's the micro-industrial complex. Let's move on to climate change, because this is the next question um, to ask. Okay, so this might work in terms of, uh, this, is, this is like all the backdrop of like, you know, US intervention in Mexico and neoliberal projects and mining and extractive industries. There's a lot of things that force that migration in the first place. But one of those at the global level, just now we're talking beyond just Mexico and the United States, um, is climate change. Again, a lot of critics are like, you know what, capitalism has this, you know, this nasty consequence of all of its extractive industries and fossil fuel, and that is climate change. So, you know, that's one way to think about it, and certainly capitalism is largely responsible in the last 30 years for just amping up incredibly, uh, um, you know, a million things, uh, deforestation and so on. But one way to think about this as well is it's not necessarily like just a byproduct. Climate change, because the question is, well, where are you going to? Why, why are migrants going to move all, from all over the world? Why are they going to move to wealthy capitalist countries to be hyper exploited, racialized, treated like crap, and then deported again? Why would anybody enter into this system? Well, they would enter the system if they were forced to enter the system. One of the ways you can force people to enter the system is climate change. Um, by producing natural disasters, by producing instant, because climate change is, it's not just like a natural phenomenon. It's like, oh, well, some, you know, some, all parts of the Earth are changing climate. Yeah, well, first of all, it's disproportionately some people. Uh, some people are disproportionately responsible for producing climate change, and then other people are disproportionately uh, affected by the results of climate change. Poorer countries are disproportionately affected by the results of climate change, and therefore, they are more likely to have to migrate, to leave, to not have the resources that they need, and they are likely to leave and migrate someplace else. Right, as, as environmental refugees, I, I mean, it's unfortunate, but I do wish that becomes at some point a real designation. But you may know that that's not a real political designation, um, at least in the United States and Canada. There are no, there's no such thing as an environmental refugee. That's like a, you know, a hope one day that there'll be an actual classification that can get somebody refugee status for being an environmental refugee. So you can say that that has happened, but it's, there's not a really like a legal standing yet for something like that um, in the United States. Um, you know, there's political refugees, that's a category. But you can't apply for refugee status because climate change. Um, that's, that's not legit. So, but one, so one of the causes is precisely altering the climate such that it increases natural disasters and disproportionately affects migrants who then have to move. Okay, um, there is, I mean, there's another aspect of this too, which is just sort of like land acquisition. Um, there's been enormous land acquisitions, and these are private companies buying up land in other, I mean, one of the biggest ones, uh, I was just looking at this book that's just documenting land acquisitions, private land acquisitions in uh, Vietnam. But it's happening all over the world, and especially since 2006. There were a series of food crises in 2006. I don't know if you remember that, but um, it happened, and uh, it, it produced this drive to like, oh, we need to like make sure we secure the land and the source of food. So a lot of private companies bought up a lot of land. And when I say bought up a lot of land, I mean often you know countries stole indigenous land and sold it to private developers who then turned it into the Lord knows what. Now they have land and food security and they own they own those properties. So anyway, one consequence of climate change um, is also this that it opens up an opportunity for land acquisition by displacing people. Natural disasters, again, natural disasters, climate-related disasters that produce areas of unlivability can become then uh, future places where development and purchase of that land can happen. So one dramatic, I mean, dramatic, silly, it's a really silly example of this is when Trump, do you remember when, you know, he was like, oh, the ice in Greenland is thawing, like, and then he, like, asked if he could buy a portion of Greenland so that he could, like, drill oil there. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> that's, that's the kind of strategy of like, you know what's good about climate change? Oil is melting. You know what that means? Or ice is melting, and that means oil. So like, I mean, that's the kind of opportunities I'm talking about. Climate change, it's not like just a side effect. It's actually a primary motivator. It's constitutive of global capitalism. And capitalism, in many ways, couldn't function without it at this point. It has monetized its own crisis. It has produced climate change and then used that climate change to displace people and then use those people to hyper-exploit them and then deport them into another, the migrant regime. Okay, so the climate is, it's not just, the climate change is not just a side effect. Um, and this is, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a context here, uh, which is that historic, I mean, there's a, there's a, why would capitalism at this point in time start monetizing its own crises? Uh, I mean, one way to think about this too, um, is that historically speaking, like during the colonial period, you have just like 
absent, like things are completely stealable, killable, enslavable, like it's cheap. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's a book called The History of the World, you know, it's not really History of the Whole World, but in Seven Cheap Things, and it's about, it's precisely about that. There's a kind of, uh, Jason Moore, this, uh, this kind of Marxist ecologist guy, calls it the, the tendency for the ecological, uh, the, the e ecological tendency for the rate of falling profit, something like that. But basically, the, the, uh, as, the, um, as, as more things are exploited, like how many mines can you open up? How much extraction is possible before you sort of reach the point where it's too expensive to extract more? How much can you, like, where are the places in the world where you can still, you know, hire people for cheap or enslave people? And then at a, as a historical level, that the, the pro, it's harder and harder for capitalists to make profit off of those things. And this is, his argument is that this is what gave rise in the 1970s to uh, financial speculation and capitalists retreating from direct investment and instead investing in their own investments and their own investments and hedge funds and so on that have actually no, you know, direct impact uh, and no real investment in the, in the real economy which is why real wages have been dropping for so long. In any case, the point is when you get to that historical moment where it's very expensive to like pay humans to do things and like pay for all this environmental destruction, then there's a tendency to, and this would be my argument, he doesn't say this, I'm saying actually there's a tendency to monetize the crisis itself and turn it into an opportunity to uh, fuel further migration and hyper-exploitation. So climate change has been turned into that. Okay, um, I'm just gonna read you, I'm gonna read you this paragraph. Um, if only, there was, uh, if only there were new ways, the capitalist dreams, to kickstart the economy and cheaply dislodge huge numbers of people from their land, devalorize their labor, and then appropriate that labor ex uh, extremely cheaply. In other words, if climate change didn't exist, capitalism would have to create it. Lucky for the capitalists, it does exist, because they created it. Ca uh, climate migrants now form what we might call, uh, adding to Karl Marx's term, a, quote, disposable climate labor army conscripted out of a standing reserve of global poverty for wherever the next climate-related disaster strikes and deployed wherever capitalism demands precarious, securitized, and criminalized labor to be exploited. So creating that pool, even if, even if people are unemployed, even if forced migration results in unemployed migrants, unemployment is not necessarily a bad thing for capitalism. Marx knew this very well. He's like, unemployment puts pressure on people who are employed. Uh, because it means that capitalists can hyper-exploit the employed labor because there's always a standing reserve labor army, is what Marx calls it, putting pressure on them like, oh, you don't like this job? You don't accept hyper-exploitation? Well, we've got people waiting for your job. So it, it's unemployment um, can actually be a benefit to capitalism. Okay. COVID. This one's a bit, this one's a bit longer. Um, so, I mean, this is, this is like where it gets sort of like really dark and really scary because you would think, I mean, of all of these cases, it sounds like, well, COVID, surely this is a secondary product of, uh, at least, I mean, this is the Marxist critique. I haven't, I haven't read any otherwise than this. All the Marxist critiques and interpretations of COVID capitalism that I've read have basically said roughly this, which is that COVID is, it's, it's the result, essentially, of short-sighted, profit-grubbing deforestation at a global level. I mean, the thing is, like, this isn't anything new. It's just, like, a lot of people care about this right now a lot more. But, I mean, like, you know, environmental researchers have been known this for a very long time that capitalism is driving global deforestation and it's producing. And it is the, it is the single most obvious cause. But, like, tons of peer-reviewed papers showing exactly this, like, dengue fever, malaria, HIV, Ebola, like, all of this, these pandemics, they are increasing in frequency. And one of the reasons they're increasing in frequency is deforestation is increasing in intensity. The more these four, and like, so the, the, the rise of these viruses, I mean, there's like, not to scare you too bad, but like there's like still, at, you know, absolutely tens of thousands of other corona viruses and other viruses out there in bats and other animals in the jungles and forests of the world. Um, and that's what awaits if deforestation continues. And they very easily, and that, that's the number that could still, that can affect in principle, estimated by epidemiologists can affect uh, and spread to human beings. So that's like, there's no shortage of pandemics uh, that are possible um, if, this is, if this is increased. In any case, the, real, the, the, the dark thing here is that it's not just that, it's not, COVID is not just a byproduct. It's actually become a constitutive part of what it means to make money for capitalism now. And this sounds, I mean, again, there's a lot of statistics and a lot of data. I'm gonna try to get to some of them, but the short of it is there's two ways in which capitalism benefits. Um, and, and actually benefits by the creation and the increased frequency of pandemics. And you might think like, oh, well, surely, you know, capitalists would be like, how could the economy be doing good under a pandemic? 
It is. Like, I'm talking Fortune 50 here, okay? The top 50 countries made absolutely billions and hundreds of billions of dollars during the worst times of the pandemic while everybody else was suffering. It was a, it, they made tons of money, and there's a lot of reasons why I'll get to. Uh, the other one is that uh, COVID has disproportionately affected frontline workers and migrants. Uh, it has both produced migrancy and it has made life a lot harder for migrants, uh, especially undocumented migrants, which, as I was saying before, the migration industrial complex, that's a benefit because you can pay those people less. People who are precarious, who are desperate, um, who are, are afraid, these are hyper-exploitable populations, um, and it makes them even more willing to, to, to cross the U.S.-Mexico border wall in, in this case. So that's, I mean, all around the world this is the case, but I know the most about that one. Okay, so that's the, that's the basic idea. And that what's really concerning is that if, if COVID is actually producing like record profits for Fortune 50 companies, where's the incentive to stop future pandemics? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, if it becomes obvious to capitalists that they can make a bunch of money off of this, if it becomes obvious that COVID and climate change actually increase human migration and displacement such that it can be hyper-exploited and the economy can be improved, like, what's the incentive to stop any of that? The incentive is the, obvious, the opposite, which is to actually increase it. And this is the realization that I'm most scared about if I said this is so dark, is because They've realized this, that, that they will make money off of the pandemics, and so they're unlikely to stop any of this. So it's not just climate change and COVID, like, it's not just collateral damage. Migrants aren't just like collateral damage from global capitalism and colonialism. They actually, uh, they're constitutive of, 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 of the capitalist money-making process at this point. I mean, arguably to some degree, migration always has, but... Um, okay, so this is the sum of the stat. I have to read these to you because it's some statistics about this. So certain humans have now destroyed 90% of wetlands in the world and converted three-fourths of land on the planet into human use areas. That's just like the scope of, of deforestation and globalization. Most of this destruction and land conversion has occurred since the Industrial Revolution, the advent of capitalism, and is directly related to new diseases. Indeed, 31% of new diseases emerge through deforestation and land use change, a direct consequence of capitalist accumulation. Nearly 60% of infectious diseases originate from forest-dwelling animals displaced by capitalist deforestation, as I was saying, HIV, Ebola, Nipah. In 2013, Ebola outbreak uh, may have been caused by deforestation from foreign mining and timber operations um, in Guinea. Capitalist extraction brought residents closer to bats, and an 18-month-old baby boy playing near a bat-filled fruit tree was the first to die and spread the disease to the village. So this guy, Peter Daszak, is uh, from the president of EcoHealth Alliance. He's done a ton of this research for a very long time. I'm just going to read what his like, statement is about this. Again, something that he's known for a very long time and many others have. The idea, so this is a quote, the idea was that something fundamental is going on in this era of pandemics, is driving all these pandemics. But no one was bringing the whole thing together. The fundamental change is what we're doing to the planet. We're not only driving global pollution, climate change, and all the rest, but we're driving the emergence and spread of all these new pathogens. Deforestation and land conversion for agriculture is one of the biggest drivers of pandemics. Okay. In short, capitalist-driven destruction is a large part of climate change and the spread of pandemics. This is not even to mention the contributions of factory farming. That's like a whole other section that I'm skipping here about factory farming and the exotic pet markets and all these other things that contribute to the spread of diseases. Um, so this all sounds quite terrible, but um, as I said before, it's making a lot of money. Um, and that's what's most disturbing is there's incentive to keep it going. Um, so capitalism unleashed the spread of COVID, but COVID in turn amplified the social and economic inequalities that capitalism relies on to exploit and underpay people. It's a match made in hell. Economists often say that capitalism is not inherently racist or patriarchal. It's ju just good old fashioned rational self-interest. You've probably heard that story from economists. Uh, to me, though, it's pretty indisputable that capitalists make more profit by getting away with paying uh, some groups of people lower wages for the same work, women, migrants. This is why COVID's amplification of social insecurity is strategically advantageous to capitalism. So the fact that COVID has had disproportionate effects on frontline workers, women, and migrants, this is, this is a structural advantage to capitalism because it only increases the precarity of, of these populations that it uses to hyper-exploit, makes them more desperate Vulnerable. Ultimately, is why capitalism has no incentive to stop ecological destruction, climate change, and the forced migration of people, plants, and animals. There's too much to be gained now from the vulnerability to stop spreading the disease. Um, I'm skipping just a little bit here. Uh, yeah, okay, so this is the stuff about COVID 
um, uh, its effect on migrants disproportionate. So with the spread of COVID, there's been an explosion of newly reinforced modified borders worldwide that have negatively affected migrant health. Between 2020 and February, uh, March 2020 and February 2021, nation states have implemented over 100,000 movement restrictions. Ironically, I mean, it's almost to be predicted given the trajectory that I've told you about increased walls and borders, like it was pretty obvious when COVID was happening, oh, this is gonna result in increased security around borders um, and it's gonna disproportionately affect migrants. So, um, ironically, the effects are that, that, uh, you know, that the United States was like, oh, migrants are bringing disease and it's like, yeah, wait a second, like who's locking them in detention centers and not providing them proper, you know, respiratory equipment and protection and spreading disease inside the detention center? Oh yeah, that was, that was you. So it's not migrants spreading disease, it's actually the United States uh, and their uh, asylum and immigration policies that are increasing and spreading disease. So that what they claim, the United States claim, is that, uh, you know, they rejected, this is, this is Trump and now unfortunately Biden, basically saying like, you know, immigrants pose a health risk. This is called Title 42, um, and the idea is that you can basically suspend, I mean, Trump was gonna do it anyway, but you know, I mean, he already did. It's like, let's just ignore our national refugee policy and turn everybody away. Um, and then COVID, he was like, yeah, Title 42, yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, so now there's like a justification to, I mean, it's not a real justification because the CDC basically said there's actually no evidence and reason why Title uh, 42 should be working here, and there's no reason why these migrants pose any kind of health threat to the United States. And yet, Trump and Biden both use that to, as a way to basically suspend all refugee claims um, and not admit any migrants. Um, so that is, I mean, it's a violation of international refugee policy, but um, apparently the U.S. doesn't care about that. Okay, the spread of COVID is also added to the dangerous conditions inside detention centers. As of February 24th, 2001, 9,000, and this number is higher uh, at this point, 9,569 ICE detainees have tested positive for COVID. So there were huge COVID outbreaks in detention centers. When officials deport infected migrants across the border, as I was telling the story, they can infect others and have uh, before crossing again. In other words, the deportation regime has also become a disease regime. It's not migrants that are bringing the disease. It's the immigration and deportation process that's actually spreading the disease by detaining people in conditions under which they're going to get COVID and then deport them back to Tijuana where there's like basically an entire sort of shanty town of people waiting to be processed, waiting to make refugee and asylum claims, uh, and now they're waiting under conditions of people arriving and staying in the same places and the disease is spread, and then, then the U.S. is like, look at all the disease they're spreading. It's like, you, that is your fault. Like, that is your responsibility of what you've done there, and now you're blaming them. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the health emergencies, Title 42. So far, Biden has continued to use the law as well. However, the, the CDC has publicly said that asylum seekers pose no health risks. Officials have expelled more than 200, uh, 204,000 people under Title 42. So it's not like a few people, it's just, it's huge numbers of people. Deported migrants now cooling up and circulating in Tijuana and border towns during a global pandemic where disease uh, could break out and spread through the cities and camps. Although asylum seekers do not pose a health hazard to the U.S., the U.S. does pose a health hazard to asylum seekers, migrants, and Mexican citizens living in nearby ports of entry. As of writing this, COVID cases are now on the rise in Tijuana, migrant camps, uh, and just due to U.S. policy. So, yes, to conclude that part, the COVID increases the insecurity of migrants, forcing them to try to cross. I mean, these are migrants, many of them, who are waiting to try to legitimately cross through the means of applying for refugee status. I mean, at what point are they going to be like, okay, this is like crazy. I'm just going to go to the desert and take a chance um, and cross over illegally. And again, who does that benefit for people to cross over un as undocumented, as criminalized? Um, it benefits the whole migrant industrial complex uh, for them to take that risk, to come over undocumented um, and not to wait there any longer catching diseases. Okay, um, now, how am I doing on time, please? Seven minutes. Seven minutes, okay. Um, so this is, this, is, this, is, this is sort of the final part about the benefits of, for, of COVID for capitalism. It's, it's bleak that this is true, um, and there's, there's a lot more. This is like a truncated version of that. Um, so many capitalists have made record profits during COVID. In March 2020, I don't know if anybody saw this, but maybe you did, Naomi Klein published a video in The Intercept called Coronavirus Capitalism and How to Beat It, where she anticipated early in the COVID pandemic that capitalists would use the crisis as a way to get financial bailouts from government. And that's exactly what happened, like, early on. I mean, you know, it's not like her original idea, like Marx has been saying this forever, like, yeah, capitalism is driven by crisis. It's fueled by crisis. Crisis, they, the capitalists love crisis because they can take advantage of it. 
And then we finally was like, yeah, that's exactly what's going to happen here. That's what I've been saying this whole time. And here's just another case of that. Somehow the rich have managed to get even richer during COVID while millions of people are losing jobs and facing mass evictions. The poorest are getting even poorer, while American billionaires' wealth grew by more than $637 billion between March 18th and June 11th of 2020. Jeff Bezos alone made over $24 billion in that time. Meanwhile, the population of hungry mothers and children, uh, children under 12, rose from 15 to 20 percent to around 40 percent. Forty-five of the most wealthy 50 U.S. companies profited since March 2020 by laying off workers. And this is the thing they said they weren't going to do. They're like, COVID's happening, but we promise we're not going to lay off any workers. It's going to be okay. And then, like, two months later, laying off all these workers. And, like, tons of people lost their jobs. Um, accepting government COVID bailouts. They accepted a disproportionate amount of COVID, of COVID bailouts. Uh, like, why is that happening? Um, and giving the bulk of their profits to shareholders instead of helping workers. So. Um, during difficult economic times, companies will choose to buy their own stock to show investors they believe in their companies, uh, the future profit. And when they do this, their stock value goes up, and the shareholders of the company, who tend to be high-income individuals, make money. But this is, this is crazy. Like, it also means, though, that it looks like the company made less profits, so they're more eligible for COVID bailouts money. So, like, you see this just like this direct line of COVID bailout money. I mean, I suppose indirect line of COVID bailout money to these companies that then share that with their, with, their, with their shareholders and investors. So a bunch of investors and the companies got way richer during this time. Again, like why would they, I mean, why would they, what's their incentive to stop future pandemics? Like that was great, we made bank on that pandemic. Um, so it, it also means, yeah, they become eligible for those, uh, those benefits. Okay, uh, I mean, it was also disproportionate. We saw like tons of smaller businesses went out of business during COVID. They didn't get the bailouts they needed. Um, and what it meant was that, you know, the larger companies benefited by sort of destroying a bunch of smaller companies. Okay, conclusion. And then we can have some conversation on this extremely uplifting um, topic. Uh, um, conclusion here. Uh, I'm going to wrap up. The main idea is that although we, can, uh, although we call migration, climate change, and COVID crises, this is not necessarily the case for capitalists for whom they've become enormous uh, um, integrated industries. Like, when they become industries, there's a vested interest to then lobby politicians to keep policies that make sure these things keep going. Um, capitalism displaces people through extractive industries, climate change, and disease, and then relies on nationalist xenophobia to criminalize and dehumanize migrants. So, you know, the strategy of, you know, fueling anti-immigrant sentiment, racism, and xenophobia, uh, that stra it's an, I mean, it's also an economic strategy. Um, it is a beneficial strategy that keeps those people uh, uh, hyper-exploited and not part of the social and political process. Um, so these things, it's not, they're really like very much part of the same integrated uh, sort of process of social circulation. This then paves the way for uh, increased economic exploitation, the rise of private security, detention and deportation industries in a vicious circle. In my view, this is why migrant justice is not just a local fight for rights or social inclusion. Its wider aims have to be set on anti-capitalism, ecological justice, and decolonization. Thank you. So we have um, um, some time for, for questions. I bet there are a lot of questions um, about this uplifting <laughs> topic, right? Um, um, it, it, it's almost like you gave, you put us in a labyrinth here of, of possibilities. So um, um, just uh, raise your hand, and I call, and I'll come um, 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 to you with the microphone. Just. Um, I was going to ask you this question. Oh. Feels like I should move, not move with the microphone. Um, earlier today in the grad talk on your article, the short article that we were to read, because you make a point in there where you say we need a movement, we need a movement-oriented political theory to grapple better with the mobile events of our time. And I was just wondering if you could, in a lot of ways, your paper seems like a call for okay, now smarter people than me go and do, go and theorize that work so we can do it. And so I'm wondering, if, but if you can speak to what you imagine that to be. And one of the things that's coming to mind is um, a lot of the women run 
sort of grassroots political campaigns that have happened in the last 20 and 30 years in Latin America as sort of politically theorizing um, maybe what you're calling for in here. And now I can't think of any of the hashtags, but there are like a million of them. Um, so yeah, that's my question. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, that's a big question, and I think I think you're right to to it in the paper because it's a very short little paper, and I, a lot of things are in there. But one of those is I just I think one way one way to help think about a really complicated geopolitical historical situation like this. I mean, this, I know we're like at a really macro level here, and there's different scales that we could look at it. Um, but I think one benefit of thinking about things in a movement oriented perspective is you, is I tend to think about things as processes of sort of circulation instead of like contradictions. So that's what I'm saying, like some of the Marxist literature that's like critiquing COVID and capitalism and climate change, it's kind of driven by this like, oh, there's this like, you know, this is a contradiction in the ideologies and like these are really, you know, opposed things. And I mean, I don't really see that they're opposed. Like, um, you know, the US-Mexico border, it's like, if you think about it, like the wall is supposed to stop people and it doesn't, therefore it's a failure. It's like, if you thought about it in ideological terms, you'd sort of mistake what was going on, which is that, oh, the wall's there as part of a larger ex industry, a deportation, criminalization industry that's meant to kind of circulate human beings. It's not actually meant to stop. It's meant to kind of like funnel them. And then the other term I didn't mention, but it, like this is the government report, cage them. It's called the cage effect. And the cage effect is like, once, people, once migrants are funneled in, then they're, they, they, they're scared to leave because of the dangers of crossing again. So then they don't leave and they stay. And then the, it's the cage effect. But you know, that's what's going on. Like it's not a question of like, you know, I don't know, like I and then, and then you have all this rhetoric, ideological rhetoric of like, you know, racist anti-immigrant stuff. Like, okay, but I mean like I mean I don't think that they're fully aware that like the way that their racism plays into actually facilitating and increasing the exploitation of migrants. Like, they don't think about it in that way, but from a movement-oriented perspective, I think we can see that, like, all of these things are participating with each other. They're fueling each other, and it's a very specific process that they're fueling. Um, so, and that's what's kind of led me to this particular, trying to integrate um, ca climate change, capitalism, migration, and COVID. To, from a movement-oriented perspective, to me, they seem very integrated. Uh, not contradictions, not, primary and secondary effects, like there's just effects, um, and we can map those effects um, if we think about it in terms of motion. But I think if we think about things in terms of like what it's supposed to do, or the goals and aims of, or rhetoric about exclusion, you kind of miss the larger picture, which is it's not really about exclusion. I mean, it's about hyper-exploitation, it's about racialization, it's about criminalization, but like Exclusion, I don't know, like as a category, I mean, it's not exactly like a hardcore exclusion. Um, it just doesn't work in that way. And that's what we find, I think, if we look kind of more empirically and historically at what's going on. I don't know about the, the, the grassroots movements that you're talking about. I'm sorry, um, off the top of my head. But um, I do think the project, I mean, I mean I, 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 when you said that, I don't know if that's what you're thinking about. I was thinking about the migrant caravan and the organizers that have organized the migrant caravan in Central, Mexico, uh, Central America and Mexico of thinking about that as a kind of strategy of movement of like, okay, we're dealing with this crazy process of like, we know what we're up against. How do we move in a way that sort of evades those, uh, those cycles? Like how can we direct a caravan of people safely and protect them because we know all the dangers that wait for all the industries that rely and like feed on those, those migrants. So I mean, I don't know if that answers the, the question a little bit. I, it's just, it's like a different methodological approach um, to think about really, I mean, I mean all kinds of stuff, but um, I find that looking at patterns of movement kind of reveals a dimension that we might miss otherwise. Like it's not the only dimension or the only way to think about things, but I think it reveals a dimension that we might otherwise miss if we weren't thinking maybe more empirically about who's moving where and how those cycles of movement keep reproducing and enter these like feedback loops. Yeah, thanks for that question. I, I have a question, a follow-up uh, uh, here. If I understood you correctly, then the, 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 the capitalist machine is kind of invested in the failure of the nation-state. That concept you didn't use that much, but it, but it is the, the, the failure of nation-state to regulate movement, climate, migrant, viruses, right? So the, the, there's an incentive for the, 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 the failure of that regulatory apparatus, artificial apparatus that is the nation state uh, uh, there. But on the opposite with the question of, of, of a woman's movements, 
I'm thinking how the, uh, the all the feminist writing, like Silvia Federici writing on, on, on reproductive labor and all those things that the state doesn't do to take care of people, right? Um, um, I'm wondering if here you're suggesting for, for because the classical left and right apparatus is the, the nation state, this modern fiction that we've created, right, will take care of regulating this uh, amoral capitalism. But then we realize that, no, it's actually symbiotic. It's a, it's a good business for the nation state to be constantly failing at regulating migrants or regulating climate change or regulating anything. Right, uh, yeah. as part of the model. So uh, I, I would like actually to return to the to the question of feminism there, right? Since feminism has become like the the the, the spear of the, the the head of the spear in so many movements today that are not necessarily socialist in the classical argument of the nation state. Yeah, thanks. That's a great yeah. That's a great that's a great point. A very really large point, and I think it, I think it's true. I mean, not failure of the nation state in an absolute sense, but as you're saying, in a kind of ongoing way that we like pretend like it's not going to fail, and then capitalism takes advantage of its systematic structural failures in a very specific way, such that it maintains the appearance of law and order and structure. Uh, only like the wall is just the absolute classic example. So Wendy Brown's book Wall. Uh, Wall states weighing sovereignty. That's kind of that's basically her argument as well. It's like there's this proliferation of walls around the world, but they don't actually work. Like what is going on? Sovereignty is just kind of like grandstanding the spectacular power of sovereignty to build giant walls that don't actually work. I mean, her analysis is that it's like you know a kind of overcompensation of the nation state to like deal with its weighing away in the face of global capitalism and non-state organizations. But I think it's more like what you're saying. It's like it's actually part of capitalism to do. Like they work together. That failure is symbiotic. It's not just sovereign grandstanding. Even though I think if you ask Trump and a bunch of Wall people, they'd be like, "Oh yeah, we're gonna build a wall." Like, but they're just not aware that it's actually playing into precisely this other thing. But that's where that ideological difference. And on the question of feminism, yeah, there's so much to say historically and contemporary about um, about about women's movement because. Because one of the things, because this, the, the, the description that I'm giving here, it's like everything I've said is like extra true for women. Like women, migrants, women who are migrants, women who are undocumented migrants, they're disproportionately affected and they're disproportionately hyper exploited. And it's precisely that. It's like the deregulation or like, you know, the, the liberal idea that like, oh, the home is like not a public space and, you know, it's a, it's a place of freedom where like, that essentially can turn into forms of like domestic violence and structural inequality inside the house because that's the state's not going to regulate that or whatever, or the failure of state to regulate becomes an opportunity um, to allow women to basically provide all of this free labor that's then hyper, that then makes it possible to, I mean, it's like, yeah, I mean, it's a source of free, cheap labor. I mean, Sylvia Federici's great because in the 70s, you know, she had a movement called like, you know, Wages for Housework. And, you know, people are like, oh, come on, like, you know, you can't possibly expect this. And she's like, yeah, I mean, because, like, if you did, like, women's labor, if you counted it up, is like, you know, 70% of GDP. You, cr you destroy capitalism. She's like, yeah, exactly. But the demand pushes you to be like, if women were actually paid for what they do, then it would be a completely unsustainable project. And that's, like, that's a very good example of, you know, a, a number of other things here happen. But, like, the intersection on gender is, like, it's everything I was saying, but, like, disproportionately affecting Questions? Making a job, thanks. All right. <laughs> um, and you already, uh, well, first, I really want to thank you for tonight's exciting talk. Um, I know I, for one, am leaving with um, mindful questions. And I think my question really relates back to Katie and then Dr. Rose's question. And I heard you speak on this a little bit. Um, but I'm curious. If you could kind of expand a little on opportunities maybe to reverse the movement or to slow the movement, and perhaps where you see or you could speculate on alternative incentives to these vicious made-in-hell markets of these crises that benefit capitalism. Thank you. Yeah, I knew somebody was going to ask that. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's not like I have a thought. Like, I, I, I have a lot of writing and stuff on revolutionary movements and all kinds of, you know, alternatives and, and different struggles and historically different struggles that have happened. Like, uh, the figure of the migrant has a whole kind of alternate history of different structures and strategies that migrants have used to escape 
um, and to generate their own uh, forms of society and that are that are not capitalist, that are not state societies. Um, so it's really a very large topic to like cover. Um, contemporary examples. Um, uh, I wrote a book on Zapatismo, <laughs> and to me, they are really they're sort of just like a really interesting um, um, and a really powerful influence um, for the rest of the world. A really good inspiration. I mean. They say, like, Zapatismo looks different everywhere it happens in the world. And so that's important. It's singular for wherever it happens. So the strategies have to be unique. Like, there's not, like, here's the solution. I would say this, though. Um, so, I mean, I, I like a lot of number of things that Zapatistas have, have done. I mean, they are very much uh, really acutely aware of this process because migrants are moving from Central America through Chiapas territory. They are encountering these people, hearing their stories, having to deal with their struggles, seeing people returning back home. And they understand the whole like, this like industrial complex and its relation to ecological destruction. And they've written a bunch about it. But um, I would say this because I think, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm just like, I've read a bunch of stuff. I'm like, I'm just one person. I mean, it's, it's hard. Like, who am I to say what we ought to do? I mean, here's the problems, but I do think the one thing is, to me, very clear, that unless everybody is involved in some way in the decisions that affect them, then, like, it's just a non-starter. Like, whatever I told you now, like, oh, I think we should, like, you know, abolish capitalism and, like, stop burning fossil fuels. Like, you'd be like, oh, yeah, that's predictable. Yeah, okay, like, I do think those things, but that's just, like, things that I think. I mean, even more deeper is to, like, we are dealing with societies increasingly where like enormous amounts, proportions of societies that claim to be democratic in some way are filled with like in some cases up to 30% of people who are not legally allowed to participate politically. Like that's just not a democracy. Like even if you bought in anything about nation state democracies, like that's just not functional. That's not, even, that's, that's not even close. So like until everybody's involved, until everybody's included, until everybody has status as like even just a step toward having a conversation about what to do and what we want, you have to address the fundamental question is like, who is we? And we is like, yeah, I'm, I'm part of that, but just one one person. So I don't, I don't have any, you know, like I don't have a blueprint, and if I did, I'd be very concerned with myself for having that, and maybe I just keep it to myself because it's very, it's much more important that everybody contribute, and the struggle there. So, the migrant justice group that I worked for, that was like a primary aim for them, was trying to include uh, a migrants who lived in the city of Toronto, um, and actually, the city of Toronto at a certain point allowed undocumented migrants to vote for city mayor. But things like that, where cities, so some of the more interesting like migrant justice work is trying to bring, like, I mean, it doesn't solve everything. It is one step because you have to address the fundamental conditions, the colonial conditions in which migrants are forced, all the things that I was saying earlier, but also, like, in the cities where migrants are, like, how to organize and empower migrants and everyone to participate politically. So, you know, sanctuary cities are a step. Uh, it's a pretty minimal step, but it's a step. Um, and cities that can be even more, um, yeah, so in Toronto we called it a solidarity city, which you know, it, it was the idea of being of providing all of the services, of mobilizing the whole city to realize that these that everybody here belongs here, um, and that everybody here can participate. So whatever we do going forward, the we has to be, it's got to be there as much as we possibly can. So I'm sorry, that's not like a fully satisfying answer other than some hand waving to abolishing global capitalism. Like, but the more concrete steps would start, I think, probably the most interesting things seem to start at like city grassroots, city level organization of starting with where we're at, who's here, and then building from those communities of what, what they want to do where they're at. Yeah, thank you for the questions. Um, I was just kind of curious of what your futuristic view for this capitalism snowball effect and kind of just what you think the future looks like at this current rate. Oh my god, so this wasn't dark enough. <laughs> like, let's go 50 years into the future. Um, how dark does it get? Have you, have you all read Ministry of the Future? Heard of this book? It's, I mean, it's like, you know, it's a, a, a sci-fi author, but that's, that's the program of the book. I'll have to say the book is darkly convincing, and like, I'm like, this sounds about right, this sounds about right to me. I mean, it's written by, now I'm forgetting his name, does somebody know Ministry of the Future? He wrote the Mars Trilogy. Oh, Kim Stanley Robinson. Kim Stanley Robinson, thank you. Yeah. So, but I mean, you know, he's like, you Should know, even, like studied with um, Frederick Jameson. Like, he's steeped in critical Marxist theory. And this, that's, this novel, I mean, it's very large, but like, it's his vision of the future. 
I can't possibly lay that out for you now, but I would say like if you if you have a dark inclination to see what the future holds, if we don't do something about it, I think it looks pretty close to the ministry of the future, what he describes, um, which is yeah, increasing global climate change and migration. Everything that I've said like will continue to get exponentially worse, like not additively, arithmetically, but exponentially worse because the feedback loops are extremely unstable and nonlinear. And that's been like every expectation. Like we're like, oh, it'll be about this much worse in the future. Every every estimate that you know climate scientists have made so far has been outstripped by what's actually happened, and that's pretty depressing. Um, you know, you can go through and like look at every estimate. They're like, it's going to be worse by about this much next time we do the assessment in five years, and then five years later, like, oh, it was actually ten times worse than what we thought it was going to be. So I'm sorry to tell you that, but like I would say worse and exponentially so. Um, that's just that's just my feeling about it right now, even though that's not that's not very optimistic. Um, I still feel like it's worth struggling. Like I'm not saying we should give up just because it's going to be worse if we don't do anything. But that's all the more reason to to do something. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> Can I just follow up on that? Is that because the bypro what we thought was a right byproduct of capitalism, migrant crisis, climate crisis, um, etc., war actually? Yeah. Uh, it, 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 the, the reason for your your, your obscure uh, uh, version of the future here is because what we thought was a byproduct is actually an incentive. It's actually something desirable. Is that the reason for this? What you call this feedback loop? Yeah, absolutely. So that would be the like nonlinear. So if you if you would ask if you would ask the question, you know, and some and, and Marxist gave this answer of like capitalism will continue to do more of the same. Um, and my response, that would be like a linear answer. It would keep doing the same things roughly that it's doing now um, with, with, with additive destructive power. And I would say that like the difference of what I'm saying here, this is like a non-linear exponential model in which I would say it's precisely because the damage that it does, it then feeds on it and turns that damage into a constitutive element to actually increase its market. Like, so for instance, like I, you know, I, I remember having a conversation with Marxists, they're like, there's no way capitalism can continue because it's just going to destroy it. All of the, it's going to eventually extract everything that it can extract, and then it'll be done. And I'm like, or not. Like, or not. It could actually get worse than it is because the destruction that it will wreak will actually produce a new situation in which it will generate a new market. So you thought it was saturating all of its markets, extracting everything that there was to extract until, and like financialization is a good example. Like, that was not, you know, that wasn't something that Marx had strictly anticipated. There's very little about uh, financialization what happened in the 1970s that Marx anticipated. I mean, Marx is still grappled with that, but I think it's just one example of many, many things that there's novelties that are generated by capitalism itself, and they happen to be you know, novelties of misery and destruction, but they become new markets that just keep making it grow and grow and grow, just when you think, like I was saying, like the ecological tendency of profit to fall, just when you think all the mines have been exploited and all the people can't possibly be you know, pushed any farther, you get COVID, you get climate change, and then you realize that the scope, I mean, it can really keep going and going and going. Obviously not indefinitely, but at an exponential unanticipated rate. Um, I have a question about information, because we were talking about the sanctuary cities and the solidarity cities that you're talking about in Toronto. And, um, I've been doing some research in the problem, the problems of information actually reaching migrant communities because it's not happening. We have a lot of um, resources, specifically in Lincoln is where I've been doing my research. We have a lot of resources in Lincoln because we are a refugee state, right? Um, but those resources are not reaching the migrant groups in time, or they're not reaching them at all. Um, and I was wondering if you have any thoughts or any suggestions about the movement of information, right? Because people are moving, but the information is not moving with or for them, right? So yeah. what what can we do or what do we do or what have other people done about that? Yeah, thanks. I like this very practical activist -y question. Um, so this is actually something we encountered in Toronto precisely, as you're saying. Um, my feeling is that it probably happens all over the place and it's not unique to Toronto or Lincoln, but um, one example of this, there's a number we can talk about, but one example were food banks. So technically in Toronto, the food banks were available for to anybody, undocumented. They, they never asked for status. 
um, but to, for giving out food. You have tons of hungry, undocumented migrants not accessing food banks. And, you know, as an organization, we're like, why is this happening? Like, why are you accessing all this food? Um, and it took actually sort of community members like talking to migrants to tell them they're not going to check your papers. And the migrants are like, well, but there's like an official government Canada sign out front of these food banks. Like, but that, it didn't entail that they were going to check status. They were never going to report, but, the, but migrants saw the sign. And so activists, so known as illegal, went to the food banks all over Toronto and said, take down the sign or put up one that says, all status, welcome, like, you know, uh, we're not, we're not going to check papers to alert people. Like, you have to make it visible um, for them to see that information. And, I mean, every situation of spreading information depends on what the information is, but I'm just giving you one example that I think it's like, it takes just, like, going food bank to food bank, school to school, like, women's shelter to women's shelter, and saying, like, you, you know that migrants aren't coming here because they're afraid. They think you're going to deport them because you're an institution providing services. They think you'll report them. And they're like, oh, no, we wouldn't do that. Well, you need to, make, you need to broadcast that. Like, all these, institu all these you know, uh, institutions have to make this very visible. Uh, I remember after the Muslim ban, there was like all these posters that went up around campus at the University of Denver that were like, refugees welcome. You know, and it was, it was, you know, it was, it was inspiring, but like something like that, like signs that are like undocumented people welcome, like refugees welcome, like not just, oh, officially we won't ask for papers, but we're not going to like, you know, make that obvious. So it all depends. One more quick example, because uh, I really liked how this would work. There were women's shelters uh, where migrants were, um, migrant women who were showing up in these shelters, and then the immigration enforcement in Canada was raiding these, these shelters, systematically, strategically raiding women's shelters in the middle of the night. And they would go asking, like they would stay at the door, like, oh, we're looking for so-and-so. And, you know, they would be allowed, and the shelter would allow them in because, like, it's, you know, it'd be a federal crime to, like, not allow federal immigration, like, into the shelter. So they would have to let them in. But then once they got in, they would start asking everyone and then this resulted in that deportations. And so no one is illegal, um, and I was part there for one of these, some of these rallies, like the first thing they did was like go to the shelters and say like this is what's happening in all of the shelters, like let's coordinate a meeting of all the directors of all the shelters and come and talk to no one is illegal. Like let's tell you what's going on. Here's the migrant experience, here's what you can do. When they come to the door and they knock, you say hold on, let me go get them. And, you and then you go back there and you let that person know. If you're willing, you let that person know that the authorities are there for them, and then you show them how to leave out the back door. And so they would alert all of the women in there that the authorities were here, and they would get time and give that time for the women to leave, and then go back to the door, and they would still be following the law by letting the authorities in, and then also letting the authorities know you're only allowed to ask one person. If you have a warrant for one person, one name, you can ask that one person, don't ask anybody else. So knowing Educating frontline staff, like food banks, women's shelters, like educating them about what their rights are, what they can do. They might not be willing to do it, but like here's what you can legally do to slow this process down and help uh, migrant women. And the other part of this campaign was like a really large demonstration that, and like a lot of media showing, demonstrating to the whole city that, uh, that and this, may, this might not work in the United States, but it worked in Canada, shaming the immigration officials of like, do you know what immigration officials are doing? They are raiding women's shelters in the middle of the night. Like, and then like, you know, the Canadians just like horrified, like, no, like, and then so the federal immigration is like, okay, we won't do that anymore. I mean, they stopped for a while, but they started doing it again, but like, they're just, you know, but the Canadians, like, they found that to be deplorable. We're not the United States. We're not the United States. We're not gonna do that. So they stopped doing it for a while. But you know, when you're in the United States, it's like, it might just keep going. Because uh, they don't, they're just shameless in that way. So I don't know about that strategy, but it was one that worked in Canada. <laughs> yeah, we, we could talk more about strategy if you want after, after this. I have a question. So I'm wondering what you think about the people who are not moving. I would imagine that you spent some time thinking about the rest of us that are staying in place and simply observing or moving through life and this is happening around us, but we're not engaged with it. So I was wondering what you're thinking about that and if, if you're if you're going to push your philosophy in that direction at all. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, yeah, I'm not, I, don't, I, don't, I see what you're saying. I'm not sure if anybody's totally just observing, um, but I do see what you're saying. There's a lot of, there's, there's, 
there are people who repeat patterns. So thinking about patterns of circulation and metastability, you know, we, if you, if you, and there's like an app on your phone that can like map your movement as you move around the city. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, so like if you, and if, even if you think about it right now, like all of us, like where, I mean, maybe not me because I just flew in, but like everybody's like, you go home and then you go to work and you go to the store and you could map it out and there'd be this like cycle and you'd see that like, oh, once a week I go get groceries or twice a week I go get groceries. And then it's like, then it's back to work, back to work, and then the grocery store, and then it's like, and like you could map it out and you'd see that there are these loops. Um, and if you commute, you know, and global commute times are like increasing as well, um, in part because of urbanization and sprawl and so on, but average commute times are like 45 minutes. Um, so people spend a lot of time. I mean, that's not technically considered migration because I mean, international border isn't crossed and you're not changing your residence. But I mean, like from my perspective, that's still, that's still movement. It still counts. And we should think about it as part of our life, that we're forced to commute. Uh, and what that means when we're forced to commute. Like, why, like, we're, we're repeating this pattern, and it's like unpaid, again, another example of like unpaid labor time. You're not being paid for that, or you can say, oh, well, it counts in my salary, but like, that's what the, your boss will tell you. <laughs> like, it's included in your, it's included in your wages. It's like, yeah, well, if I lived closer, like, I'd be paid exactly the same. And if I lived twice as far, I'd be paid exactly the same. It doesn't feel like it's actually factored into my wages at all. Anyway, like, but it's, it's a form of movement exploitation, is commuting this. I mean, I hate, I hate commuting, but, but I mean, like, everybody hates commuting, but like, but you can see that also commuting is, like, disproportionately raced and gendered as well. Uh, you look at people of color and, and also class as well, like, people who make less money end up having to commute longer distances. So there's a way in which that's not under the purview of migration studies. They often don't think about commute times as forms of mobility exploitation, but, I mean, it is a form of mobility exploitation, and it's definitely on all these axes of power in which people are exploited on those movements. So I mean, if you get to live in a, like a little area where like you don't, you can just walk to everything. I mean, that's that's great. Maybe you're feeling like you still have, you still like you know the, your movement only becomes so limited, but you're still moving. And so what I would what I would what I would think about stable stability in that way. I mean, that would be you know true for all kinds of people. Earlier today, we were having. A a discussion about you know the right to stay somewhere like migrants often will they like I want to, I don't want to I don't want to migrate I'd like to stay where I'm at like that too is a form of resistance to the circ the circulations the patterns of circulation is to resist those by staying so it's not like movement is always good or movement is always bad it's just a question of like which pattern are you integrated into um, and I mean everybody is to some degree and that's the question of like which patterns are you integrated in. Are you part of this circulation? Are you part of a different circulation? Like, what systems are you reproducing by moving every day, iterating them over and over again? Um, and so that's just, again, it's one perspective or method of thinking about what's going on and looking at the different axes of which, in which those patterns happen. But thanks, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. I think we may have time for one quick question. If there's a burning question, Steve, that somebody wants to ask. Well, yes, yeah. Um, Real good. It's, it's partially because I think this question might have a non-answer, but I think just because you were talking a lot about pandemics and I'm thinking a lot about the U.S. economy, a huge part of the U.S. economy is the like health industrial complex, like the medical complex. And as you're talking about, obviously, the sort of interconnectedness with migration and pandemics and the sort of rhetoric of people from outside of the U.S. bring the disease into the U.S. This might be my brain trying to cling on to people who want to make money in healthcare are going to intervene in some capacity so that pandemics don't happen quite so often anymore. Um, but I was yeah. just wondering if there was any sort of like interplay between, in, you, in terms of looking at the, econ like the COVID economy, if you will, because I, I have to say I don't know that much about what that's done to the medical industrial complex, but I assume it's bad? It is, I'm sorry, it really is. Like, yeah, I, no, I, know, I had the same question, I had to research it for this paper on COVID capitalism that I was writing, I was like, well, surely the medical industry, like, you know, and I had some assumptions about what I thought, and it turns out, though, that, like, even among privatized, like, hospitals and medical facilities, that what happened is, like, you know, there were bailouts, government bailouts that went to medical facilities. But guess which medical facilities got the most bailouts? 
It was the most wealthy ones in the most wealthy places. It's like they got the bailouts, they got bigger, and other hospitals like went out of like business, like they went under. Like smaller hospitals actually like just collapsed, and that was good for the market for the for the larger hospitals. Um, I I had not thought this deep, deep down to this medical area until I read this, and I was like, oh my god, I can't believe that that is also an effect. I would have thought that you know it would have had maybe like I don't know more like more widespread and less, I mean, and more even distribution, be, just because if every hospital is saturated, like how could there be room for some to grow and others to collapse during a pandemic? And yet a bunch of smaller hospitals went out of business and like disappeared during a pandemic. It doesn't make any sense, but it was related to the disproportionate uh, money by, from, the, from, the bailout, from the bailouts. And obviously over, you know, overburdening all the systems. Thank you so much for a fantastic talk. Thank you so much for